case was declared and the August law was imposed to facilitate social distancing and people working from home. And the committees that uh, have been mentioned previously were formed. One of the committees was one on food security and county coordination. Because immediately the, the, the situation presented itself as a difficult case, counties started to close businesses, started to close markets, started to close factories. And so we were not just looking at a health crisis, we were also looking at a, at a food crisis because the people then would lose their jobs and they would stay at home and they would not be able to afford food and, uh, and so on and so forth. So in the ministry, we created the food security war room, uh, which is basically a team of technocrats that supports the committee. This uh, food security war room is backstopped by McKinsey and other partners. And uh, it includes, uh, it includes uh, of course, McKinsey to provide TA support. And the IFAD has also uh, sort of helped us with the uh, help logistics to look at the, the logistical end and data and models to see where food will go or not go. Rockefeller has helped us by hiring EAGC to look at markets and how they are functioning in the times of COVID. And of course, the other development partners are coming along, other NGOs are coming along. And uh, all these are part of the food security war room. And uh, basically, if you can see the screen there, we identified key goals for the ministry using the, this, uh, this uh, group of uh, technical people to ensure food availability, accessibility and affordability, and also for water, not just food, and also continue support for subsistence livestock farmers and fisher folks. We made it clear that at no time should anyone contemplate stopping the farming activities from going on, because then that would uh, snowball from a health crisis into a food crisis and it would be hard to keep people in their houses if there's no food and then of course we want to maintain our agricultural output and production because we feel that is the launch pad from which the economy can recover and out of those we identify 10 high level interventions with the initial focus on the first three which are dealing with flow of produce from production to markets and uh, imports or exports, whatever is relevant, and ensuring minimal disruption of markets, and uh, to make sure that the population is able to access food and water, and price is st prices are stabilized. So these were key, because in our minds, it was clear that we could not feed 47 million Kenyans as a government, even if we wanted. So it was clear that the economy, the food system must be open from production to markets and also the issue of inputs. And we have really made that understood across to government. And uh, that's why you see we are continuing operations and where there are difficulties, we come in to unlock issues. The issue of uh, number four, which is sufficient stocks, I'll come to it later. And the issue of number five, Water, at least for the urban settlements, is now free. It will be backstopped by Treasury. And the Ministry of Water is putting up measures to make sure that water is available everywhere and it's not an issue. And there's a lot of rain. It's uh, overflowing everywhere. All the dams are overflowing. The issue of food relief was quite contentious. And uh, I think in the end, we settled for, for e-voucher so that people don't have to move food around, remember what happened in Kibera. And even for the philanthropists, they are encouraged mm -hmm. to use cash um, in their account that uh, was designated for this. All of us are contributing to it. And then this money would be dispersed through cash transfers or e voucher which is easier to account than uh, moving lorries of food around villages when we are in this kind of uh, situation. And uh, 
So we have created teams in the ministry around these four work areas, including number 10, which is an enabler, which is communication. And we are inviting people with data, with inputs, to join these work streams. Yesterday, we sent an email to all development partners and some of the identified donor organization and private sector organization to join the situation room. I know some have wanted to join the cabinet subcommittee, but uh, we were advised that the best place would be the situation room where we all meet as stakeholders and then filter the information to cabinet. So these teams are working every day to look at the situation every day. And the goal is just those key goals that I, I have highlighted there. Now we are collecting mostly data from counties on food availability, food access, and food affordability. From CECs, we have a program funded by CEDA called the Agriculture Sector Development Support Program, which has staff in all the 47 counties. And they work with the county CECs to make sure that we have data. Right now, we have preliminary data. The counties had, had given us uh, production data from within their counties, which we could see. Uh, the quantities based on the data from counties, but uh, it's still weak and uh, we are trying to strengthen data collection uh, working with those systems that we have uh, established. And uh, we had also looked at market data uh, by just looking at 47 key markets, but this data will be strengthened this week to cover more markets so that we have a rough idea of what, uh, what is going on here, there. Some counties had closed the markets, uh, about five markets, um, especially Mombasa, Nakuru, Kisi, and Kisumu. And we were trying to work with them to make sure that markets remain open, but, but COVID compliant. So we have issued guidelines there on our website, kilimo.go.ke, COVID-19, and there are guidelines there for every value chain player, we have issued guidelines to guide them on how to move, how to behave, and how to continue working and supporting the food chain without uh, endangering themselves or others. Because the issue of price is key, we've been tracking these uh, food prices. We, uh, in, uh, we have data from 10 counties, and uh, we find the highest prices are in the counties in Western Kenya, where 20 uh, food has gone up by 20 because sometimes they rely on Uganda and when there are difficulties of hikes. But on average in the country at large, the increases have been modest between 5 to 16 percent because of the initial fears, people felt like everything had to stop. But I think now that everybody is farming and food has been allowed to move, I think there are less challenges. But with the help of uh, Help Logistics, which is uh, a, a philanthropic organization also of the Kune Foundation, we're going to get farmer models about where there is a pain and where there, is, there are surpluses and whether the supply chain management is working properly or not. So we are going, going to expect more data as we move along. And uh, in terms of uh, the food balance sheet, Yes, we have uh, enough food up to June. Uh, maize, rice, sorghum, wheat, millet, beans, green grams. And we don't have data for fish, but you know fish is a continuous process. The fisher folks are free to go and fish. In the lakes and also in the aqua aquaculture farms and also in the ocean, we have made sure of that and uh, tom tomatoes and potatoes, we, we still don't have data, but in the next uh, phase, we'll uh, add uh, more data. But in general, from the data that we have been collecting, as a result of both the long range and the short range, we see we have a good food balance sheet up to end of June, and the rains are behaving themselves. Uh, farmers are, are planting. We have data that shows that farmers are planting. There was a bit of a situation. We have data, also information that shows that inputs are reaching the farmers. Prices might be slightly high, but you know, the system has not uh, collapsed and we will not uh, make it collapse. 
uh, our, we are there to facilitate it and we welcome inputs from other stakeholders. I think this is the second meeting, our third meeting I'm holding. We have discussed with donors, we have discussed with Kenya Chamber. I think we had one meeting with Kenya Chamber, although it was a, a bit uh, uh, unstable, the internet connection. Then we have this meeting and uh, we, 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 are, we are meeting with counties. And at the same time, one of the things that we, we are doing, uh, despite all this, you can see number seven there, the issue of low-cost invasion. We're working very closely with FAO and uh, other partner organizations and other philanthropic organizations which are supporting FAO to make sure that uh, the low-cost crisis uh, does not exacerbate the COVID crisis. So we are managing the low-cost. We have made sure that there are enough pesticides in the country and enough fertilizer, and that uh, we are able to support both farming as well as locust uh, control. So I think uh, in terms of the issues of uh, fiscal nature, which are the purview of Treasury about how much money they are collecting, I'm not uh, competent to comment on those ones, but I'm sure they are doing their best. There's a supplementary budget. They are doing some adjustments. They are cutting back on some programs which are not of an emergency nature. So, I think uh, by and large, uh, things are looking good. And I think with your support and the teams that we have put in place, which includes also private sector players and other organizations, we, we, we are optimistic that uh, we will continue responding to this situation as it evolves and that we'll have enough data to guide us in the decision-making process. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Amadi, for that elaborate um, information that you've shared with us. I'm glad to hear that, uh, you know, before the COVID-19, we were battling the locust and uh, some positive news there, availability of pesticides and uh, uh, the efforts that are being taken into practice to control uh, the locusts. Uh, the rains are behaving, as you've said, I've heard you say that inputs are reaching farmers though at a high price. And uh, the good news that farmers are actually farming. I think most of the issues that uh, that really sets us uh, rolling in terms of understanding the, 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 the environment as it is from the government end. I think by end of uh, this meeting, we really wanted to have a comprehensive understanding on the general food security situation so that we can see how the philanthropy side can plug in and the business side can also plug in in terms of support um, uh, and, um, and practical mechanisms that we can put in place towards the most vulnerable population. Uh, again, at the end of this meeting, we also wanted to have commitments from the participants, specifically our side on how we can enhance partnerships with the government in terms of filling the gaps which are existing uh, to secure livelihoods of the vulnerable uh, populations that we are talking about. And so we have an interesting conversation ahead. Um, uh, Buona PS, before I let you go, are there gaps that you can quickly talk about or quickly point that you can see us plug into? Yeah, I think, uh... I think the biggest uh, issue is that the number of vulnerable Kenyans will most certainly increase. Uh, that data is not with me, it's with the State Department of Devolution and the State Department of Interior, because there are a lot of people who are not working with their day job, so they have fallen uh, into the needy section of the population. So mm -hmm. I think uh, that is one area where, where philanthropists can continue to support so that uh, as many of those people are able to access food. Our estimates are that uh, the government is working with 5.8 million Kenyans who are in that state, uh, but uh, I think it could be higher especially in urban settlements, uh, 
where they are not able to grow their own food. The other one is the markets. I think markets, border borders, and you know border borders, they don't just carry people, they also carry milk, they carry vegetables to back and from. They need uh, to be assisted to be COVID compliant because their margins are very small also. So if they have to buy masks and the sanitizers and all these things, it yeah. it's also into their margins. But uh, at times, at the beginning, they had been stopped in some counties, and yet they are the ones that milk farmers rely on to get milk to the next point or to the collection point or to some other place. So markets uh, supporting the vendors to be compliant, supporting the markets themselves to be compliant mm -hmm. and to exercise social distance and hygiene. I think that is key because that's the only way you can keep them the food supply chain open. Otherwise, if we close markets, then the farmers will be rotting with their food and Kenyans will be, will be starving. So I think uh, if you can reach out to get more data with the State Department of Devolution that with P.S. Sunkuli and P.S. Kibichu, mm -hmm. so that you can see how many Kenyans are vulnerable. I don't have that data. But also there are the points, especially the markets and the mamambogas and the border border people who support that very informal economy. I think if we're able to stabilize that and they are not into poverty because they are not able to work, I think that would be would be key. Mm -hmm. A lot of farmers also have lost markets because the restaurants have gone down, hotels have gone down, schools have gone down. So that means the loss of, loss of markets and the loss of income. So I think that is another angle that can be looked at. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bana P.S. Um, I think that really sets us going well. I want to give it to Francis Gitonga, who is the chairman of the Agriculture Committee within the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, who will uh, just give us a brief about what they are already doing uh, towards this conversation we are having. And then Maisa, I think you can jump in after, after Francis to take us through the plenary uh, deliberations. Thank you. Francis? Uh, can you hear me, Francis? Okay, Nemaisa? Now I have to speak. H Hello? Yes, yes. Uh, so I can just give the brief that Francis was going to give. Right. It was as regards the work that we are doing uh, as a chamber. And um, so I, I'll, I'll speak on that. Um, so as a chamber, that we have really been uh, focused on what's happening in terms of agriculture and uh, the, the food supply chain. And uh, we'll begin carrying out research this week um, to understand how the supply chain market um, has been affected by, by COVID, specifically focusing on the retail trade and uh, uh, the markets that are within Nairobi County. We want to understand how food is moving from outside Nairobi and coming into Nairobi and how uh, things like the curfew have impacted them and how we can ensure that the supply of goods continues. We have a program that we are running with a company called Retail Pay funded by CEDA. And our program allows us to, um, we, we are directly in the supply chain. So we are able to link suppliers directly with traders. So because of COVID, the one thing that we have found is we need to have innovative ways of uh, doing business. And the platform we have provides uh, retailers a lot of um, facility to do business without necessarily having face-to-face. 
face-to-face -face contact with uh, suppliers and uh, quite a number of distributors. Our process actually eliminates, um, we, we distribute the goods, we collect the goods, we aggregate uh, produce and then send it out into the market. So we want to do a survey, a survey of Nairobi to understand um, uh, which products or rather which uh, goods come into Nairobi. So we'll be looking at uh, some of the, the products and uh, that the PS had actually mentioned. We want to see how dry foods are coming into Nairobi and how the fresh produce is also moving in Nairobi, just to get um, some numbers and some data that we can work with. We did a survey uh, of our members in the beginning of March. And from our survey, we found that 81% of businesses expect to be severely affected by the pandemic. In addition to the survey, we interviewed traders in Wakulima market, city market, members of the Juakali, um, the hawkers, and small scale traders, and farmers, mechanics. And some of the challenges they told us is they have um, the challenges with liquidity, uh, reduction of cash flow due to reduced number of customers, there was a fluctuation of the, in the price of goods, there was lack of sanitation, market congestion, and supply chain challenges like lack of raw material. So through our trade facilitation program, we felt that this would actually assist uh, government in getting uh, goods to the people. For instance, now we have the, um, the 2,000 shillings pilot that has been launched to give those that are vulnerable ac access to finance. But if they don't have, if they're not able to purchase uh, goods because the stores that are in their neighborhoods don't have the goods, then you still end up with a challenge. So our platform is, can actually close that gap and ensure that the retailers have something to sell to those that have been given the stipend. This uh, pr uh, platform as of ours is digital and it's quite versatile. It uh, has the po possibility to be B2B and B2C. So it, um, it can go online. It's currently an online platform, but it's not open for, uh, for general public, but it's a possibility that the platform can do. We want to look at the middle to low income uh, neighborhoods. And from our survey, we shall demarcate Nairobi in terms of uh, neighborhoods and um, their income levels, and also understand how the markets in those areas also um, are functioning. We don't want to, you know, we understand that COVID has affected everybody. Uh, no one has been left out in this uh, pandemic. And we have to come together to assist and make sure everyone is, is not left out and we don't um, forget. This is definitely in line with the SDG goals two and number three, which we are also very keen on progressing as KNCCI. We've also done a lot of work within the counties. Our county chambers are in the county, um, so uh, we we have um, we also have uh, our counties who are in all the county committees that are dealing with um, COVID, and we understand that um, uh, some of the markets have been closed. Our members have helped with sanitation uh, to ensure the market, um, you know, they are able to um, to prevent COVID. We also have masks that have been done by the we have masks that have been done by our county chambers for distribution as well. And on our end, we are working with the youth and women to ensure that they also are able to supply the cloth masks to ensure that we have uh, there's more job creation in the market. Additionally, we have we have also been in talks with the fashion industry because they too have a challenge at this time. Their their particular products are not um, are, are not actually moving in this market. These are things that people are not interested in. So we have to find a way to mitigate this for them and ensure they can continue to have uh, money in their pockets. Uh, I would like my agriculture chairman, Mr. Gitonga, to speak on the counties. I think now he should, yeah, he should be able, I see his, um, his microphone is now ready to, uh, for use. Uh, Mr. Gitonga, over to you. He needs to unmute his mic. I need to unmute. Mamaisa, Mamaisa he needs to unmute his mic. Okay. Uh, or maybe the the host can unmute for him. Yes, Evans, can you please unmute for him? 
yeah, we are, there is. Uh, yeah. Is he still talking, really? Uh, yes, I, I, well, I, yes, but we can't hear him. Paige, can you unmute the speaker, please? Yeah, he's still muted. I'm trying to reach my team to unmute him. Okay. Paige, can you hear me? Please unmute the speaker. A uh, question. In the meantime, Evans, will you allow a question or two to the minister before he leaves? Yeah, I think that's okay. Nemaisa? Yes, it's okay. Uh, Mr. Umar, you can go ahead. As, as uh, Evans' team, uh, um, so thank you very much, uh, 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 uh Boga and Evans, thank you for setting up this uh, conversation. My name is Paul Uma, and um, I sit on the board of the Kenya Chamber of Commerce and Industry. I also sit on uh, Francis Kimemea's committee, and I'm also the regional director for Nyanza region. So first, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Hamadi Boga, because I know we've been having a conversation with him uh, at the chamber level. Uh, we also know that he's been involved with us closely and we had the webinar with him a few weeks ago so we really are grateful for the good work the government is doing um i noted the the good work that uh, the ministry is doing especially the ministry of agriculture um and then i also noted some two aspects which i thought possibly i could uh, i could indulge the minister in in terms of two questions so the first one is that um, uh, the, the ministry has done a lot of good work in the food security uh, with regard to the maize and, 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 and other um, key, key food stuff. But there's a big gap in the fish data. data. Um, so one of the questions I wanted to find out from the minister is what challenge uh, is, uh, are we facing with regard to getting the fish data? Because we know the people from around the lake, uh, food, fish is literally a staple food, especially for those closest to the lake. Uh, secondly, we also know that um, that there are uh, both private sector and uh, government bodies who should be put into this data. So should, should put it, be put into this data. So possibly we can know where the challenges, and then we can then also find out is there uh, there are areas where then uh, the National Chamber of Commerce can be able to to work closer with those those uh, those government departments. Second day, and lastly is um, we had a big problem uh, with regard to the closure of the markets you know, in Kisumu, Kibuye, in Homa Bay, in Migori, and in Kisi, and we are glad to hear that now there are some guidelines. My question is, Bwana PS, is this information, this guideline, is it already down there with the committees, uh, especially at the subcommittee level, because we know that uh, they are the emergency uh, committees. So those are my two questions. Is this information down with the, especially at the sub 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 uh, emergency committee at constituency level and uh, if if yes how is it being um, shared down there and how can the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce support because we know that uh, we can um, be able to support you we have a network that goes right down there thank you very much over to you Bana PS yes. thank, thank you very much for those questions the fish data right now, the the in the food in the food security war room, we have also the state department of fisheries mm -hmm. represented the PS and the director of fisheries. So they are the responsible for fish statistics, and we have been pushing them for more data and from uh, aquaculture as well as from the lake, as well as from uh, the coastline. So I think in the next update, we will see more data from fisheries. Number two, we are also working uh, private sector players like Victoria Fisheries. I think this uh, uh, guy who's doing cage farming somewhere along the lake, he provides a lot of data. And now that fish from China is having challenges reaching here, 
I think he's the, one of the large scale fish aquaculture farmers who is uh, supplying and he actually right from the word go indicated that he has a lot of fish to supply. And uh, so we are, he's in the situation room and he's also providing us with the stock levels from his site and all that uh, fish information. I think in the next presentation, it will be much more clearer. And then the issue of um, uh, counties and the markets, uh, we have formed the, the county food security committees and also food security war, war rooms. We work very closely with the Council of Governors. They sit in the food security war room. And every decision that pertains to counties, including those regulations, we make it with them. And then there's a letter that goes from PS Munya to all the county governors, telling them what to do for each situation. So we have guidelines for extension workers, guidelines for markets, guidelines for everything that has to do with the agricultural value chain on our website, but we have also written to the various actors uh, through the associations. We have written to the county governments and we have written to the county commissioners through the Ministry of Interior, just to make sure that we don't overlook anything. I think it would be good if the chamber could go into our website, download some of those guidelines, because I know the chamber is very active at the county level. Share with your members there so that you can you can help us to remove this uh, misunderstanding. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bona Pierce. I see Mr. Evans, or uh, is it Nemaisa? It's uh, Nemaisa, it's Nemaisa. Okay, yeah. whoever was moderating the plenary. Yes, um, I had seen a hand up from uh, Francis. I don't know if you're able to pick up, I mean, to, to, to speak now. Hello, um, so if anyone has any questions at this time for any of the speakers, um, we can proceed. You can just raise your hand and we'll pick on you. Uh, Bona Pierce, I've, I see a question where someone is asking if we can get the presentation after this uh, conversation. Yes, of course, we can share it with the chamber. Thank you. Well, I see that we look satisfied with the session as it has been. Um, I think we've learned quite a bit this time um, in terms of how what's happening. One of the challenges, of course, has been the sharing of information, which one appears you have done quite well. I know a lot of the people in the agriculture sector had thought we had forgotten about the locusts, and those were some of the questions that they had been passing on. And I'm now happy to be iterated that you no, know, the locusts have actually been well taken care of, and you are now looking into other areas where you can support um, a business to continue. To the I, can, I, I can show you a bit, yeah? Yes. Uh, on the locust situation, just to show you the work that we, we are doing. Yes. Just just a small bit. Mm. Uh, let me share my screen again. So if you look at uh, at uh, this map of Kenya here, which we are working very closely with FAO on the local situation, and you can see from this map. Uh, we've been uh, tracking the swarms through surveillance with helicopters and also ground people and also reports from the county. So we know where the swarms have been and where hopper bands, these are the babies, have been and uh, in the different periods from 24th to 30th. Every week we get uh, a fresh map and we keep uh, tracking where this uh, surveillance is going on. And uh, in all these areas, we've been spraying, we've been spraying. We have uh, 
quite an active population of uh, people in the field. Uh, 600 NYS uh, and uh, county workers. We have also trained youth and with FAO ourselves and the Desert Locust Control Organizations uh, scattered across the, mainly the activities in, is in 13 counties. And uh, in some areas where it's written data is incomplete, we have sent surveillance uh, helicopters to land in the middle of nowhere and see whether they can track anything. But the cooperation with the FAO has been very good. And uh, this is the agricultural calendar. As you can see there from September to August, we are here in April. And we, we are, you can see we still have immature swarms and mature swarms. So every morning we wake up and spray. Every evening we 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 we, we survey with surveillance and map where to spray. We expect this situation to go with us up to around June, July, August there. But uh, we are stocking enough chemicals to make sure that we have uh, all the information. We 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 have all the tools for interventions. We have like uh, between six to eight planes at any one given time spraying out there and two helicopters for surveillance. This is the way it looks, the global picture and how it will move. You can see most of it in the infestation is in the Horn of Africa. The other areas have serious infestation, but ours is the most serious in Eastern Africa. Other areas like South Sudan and Uganda are threatened, but they don't have as, as much while the rest, usually the desert locusts are in this belt, in this belt up here in the Sahel region all the way up to Senegal and uh, Mauritania, that is its uh, territory. So for us, we are an invasion country, we are not a host country. Ethiopia is more a host country. Ethiopia, South Sudan, Eritrea, they're always battling this. But for us, it's, uh, for the last, uh, the last time we had an invasion was in 2007. And this is the largest invasion in 70 years. But we see this uh, around May, June, July, starting to ease, and the population migrating in towards Ethiopia, parts of Sudan, and even all the way to Pakistan, across the Indian Ocean there. So we have to sustain the fight so that not as many as as, uh, as is expected, will fly away to go. Because if they fly away, once the winds change, they will come back. And we have a lot of information on the FAO website, uh, on this Locust Hub. And this data is, uh, we input into this data because we are using technology to collect the Locust information using an app called eLocust data. And even here, we have partners like MassiCorp, uh, plant village and uh, other universities who are collecting data at the same time helping us to manage the locust problem. So we, we are taking this seriously because we don't want after COVID to continue wrestling with locusts. But it's, a, it's an effort that is regional. It, it doesn't depend on just what we do. It also depends on what others in the region do. And our biggest Achilles heel is in Somalia, where because of insecurity, they are not doing much. And that is why even counties like uh, Mandera and Garissa are not reporting as much, not because they are not there, but because it's very difficult terrain to work in from a security perspective. But we are doing our best. So that is uh, just to give you a picture of that side of, uh, of things. Thank you. Thank you, Bona Pierce. That's very well detailed. I yeah. have a question from Gloria. She wants to understand whether the wildlife is getting affected by the spray that is being used. So she saw something on social media around dead birds, and she wanted to know what measures are being put in place to protect the wildlife against the spray. Now, sometimes it's very hard. We That was from Marsabit. You know, we've been spraying since... Uh, January. I'm a biologist myself, uh, and I understand this uh, this uh, challenge of pesticides and the need for biological control. In the beginning, we were using a chemical called phenytrothione, which is targeting the 
orthopterans. Orthopterans are the grasshopper class. And uh, we didn't have much uh, challenge there. Because as we spray, we go and look at the, the effectiveness of the pesticides, and we also look at whether it's hitting other non-target pests. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot get phenytrothione anymore. We have struggled to get it, and when we get it, it's in very small quantities, like they run out of raw materials or something, also because of COVID. So usually it comes from Japan or China. Yeah, and uh, so we have moved to another chemical called delta methylene. Delta methylene is a pyrethroid. So it, it, it kills a, a broader range of insects compared to, to phenytrothione, which is an organophosphate. But uh, what, we, what, we, what we have done is to train the sprayers on matters of safety and also train the sprayers and the people who are doing surveillance to also collect data. When I had a conversation with FAO, the team that is uh, uh, specializing in, uh, in locus at the beginning, I had the same concern. Uh, but they said, what choice do you have, really? Either you let these guys continue multiplying here, and usually they do like 300 eggs per, per, per adult. Eh? So, and this is four weeks. So within four weeks, and another four weeks and another four weeks, you could have three, four generations exploding. So to a point where you don't even have any, any control. So right now we don't have any other tool. We have also bought uh, uh, biopesticides. This is a, is a fungus called metarhizium, but this works only with the, with the hoppers, the babies, before they learn to fly. So, because the, the biological control takes like uh, five days. And uh, with the kind of crisis we have, as you've seen there, it's red. You want to make sure that you control the thing very fast. With, the, with locusts, if you don't control them early, the costs will e escalate because you'll be dealing with a bigger population. But we are taking a lot of care. We have uh, teams of environmentalists also working alongside the people who are spraying so that we can look at environmental impact assessment. Uh, especially we are worried about the bees. And, uh, but mammals are highly unlikely because these, uh, these uh, pesticides don't tag, they, 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 they are, they are, there is something called selective toxicity where you, 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 a molecule targets a particular species and because of uh, its biochemistry. So they are not effective against uh, mammals or even, even, even birds. That story, I think, uh, we tried to track that story and we even went there and uh, it didn't really, really add up because otherwise we would be seeing a lot of dead birds along the way. And uh, so we, we are keeping a close eye on that and we have a, an environmental uh, management plan to mitigate any environmental effects because we're working with FAO, they have more experience in this area. And also we are working with World Bank resources and they are, they are very sensitive about environmental issues as, as we are ourselves. And we know in those areas, there are a lot of conservancies. And so we are also working with those conservancies. But the most important thing is that we have to manage this uh, situation. Thank you very much, Bona Pierce. I had a question from uh, Lucy Mushoki. Lucy, maybe you can uh, yes. ask your question. Uh, Lucy? Okay, let's give the PS a second. Um. Um. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, PS, for that elaborate and uh, very well. Um. It, uh, um. I liked your presentation. 
and and thank you for bringing us to speed on what is happening in the control of the locust. It's been very worrying, especially now that you have to deal with the COVID-19 and the issues of locust. I mean, it has been quite a worrying time for, for us as Kenyans, but thank you for that reassurance. Um, I appreciate all the other presenters, but I, again, um, I want to bring up an issue that is coming up every day. Uh, despite um, the presentation and the reassurance from the ministry, I know that we have a serial millers association, but PS, is there a way, uh, is there a lack of communication between your office and the millers because they keep on complaining that they don't have enough, they don't have maize for milling. I do not know what is going on there and is there something you can do? What's a communication breakdown there? Because we need to get that reassurance from our millers that everything is okay. Thank you. Yeah, we, we are in constant communication with the millers. Uh, and we are in constant communication with farmers who farm maize. Millers say there is no maize, farmers say there is maize. <laughs> so we are, we are caught in between playing the referee. Our food balance sheet for maize shows that we have maize up to June. That's the food balance sheet. Uh, because the way we collect data on food balance sheet is we try to get what the millers have, if they will reveal it honestly. We try to get uh, what uh, farmers have, if they will reveal it honestly, so they input data. And then we get imports uh, across the border and do some estimates. And then using um, technology, satellite imagery and uh, ground truthing, we estimate production for the long range and short range. So this year we had 43 million bags of maize from our estimates. And this is official government statistics from the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics. And we have uh, a consumption rate of about 3 million bags per month. And these 3 million bags is not for milling. These 3 million bags include githeri, include uh, roast maize, include Mukimo, so the milling portion is uh, very small. In fact, the larger part is what is not milled. So schools are closed. Uh, a lot of activities are gone down, purchasing power has gone down. So we are estimating also the consumption of maize will not be as, uh, as is. Usually the pressure is in April, but we don't want to just uh, uh, ignore what the cereal millers are, are saying. We are in constant communication with Paloma and uh, the other millers like uh, UGMA and the Grain Belt. In fact, every day they are sending me WhatsApp messages here about the situation. And uh, the, the, the latest I got from the guys in Rift Valley, he says, actually these farmers have maize. Actually now, because they realize the government is not buying, they are trying to get to, to offload it before the importation. Because what we have allowed for is an importation window of about a month or two to get uh, the deficit of two million, two million bags of white maize and uh, the deficit of, uh, of uh, animal feed, two million bags of yellow maize. So that's four million bags. And the Gazette notice was issued yesterday, and uh, we hope uh, people can take advantage of that. We did that at 14% duty and 10% duty respectively for white and yellow to cushion the farmers so that uh, the price of uh, white maize arrives here at slightly above 3,000, which is where the farmers uh, prefer the maize prices to be and the uh, yellow maize to come here at around slightly above 2,500, which gives an advantage to the animal feed millers. So we are in constant communication with them and uh, we shared the data with them. They had some questions, but uh, the questions were not about quantities. The questions were seeking clarifications, which we did, but we welcome because we don't want to be caught uh, napping 
So we, we, we welcome, and that's why we are, we are tracking all this data every day. And if we see any shift, we will act accordingly. In the past, we have bridged our deficits through imports from the region. There is an agreement between the East African community countries to allow goods to flow. And people will be sanitized, people will be uh, temperatures taken at the border, but the goods will flow. And then once they are inside here, they have a guideline on how to behave. Um, after they have delivered their maize, quickly they have to turn around and go back. And, and so they are, they, there's that agreement, which was one of the very first ones. I think all we have to do is encourage trade to go on, because that's the only way we can continue feeding our the Kenyans. Thank you, Bana Piers. I have one, one, one question and uh, one hand up. So the question is, with the need for food as medicine for preventive measures, against COVID, do we have enough required foods in distribution and how do we communicate better on the need to change food options as preventive medicine to the public? Yeah, we have a team from Ministry of Health and Ministry of Agriculture working on a menu depending on where you are that will give you balanced diet, uh, whether it's maize or nguashe or mukimo or the other foods. And that will be communicated so that people have options that will enable them to stay healthy. Because uh, immunity is the first defense in this. It's the only defense, actually. The rest is just ventilators. But uh, it's the body that has to be uh, empowered to fight. And that is why nutrition is important. So in the team, there's a nutrition component that uh, gives guidance on nutrition issues. Thank you. I have two hands up, Evans and Patrick, if you can be short. Yeah, I think, Nemaisa, for me, I just wanted to uh, bring in a different perspective. Can we also explore some commitments from the participants uh, in terms of how we can enhance partnerships, specifically aligned to the gaps that the PS had pointed out. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Nemaisa. Uh, I have one question to PS. Uh, regarding regarding um, the provision, uh, the, how eVoucher would be working to the extent that the small-scale farmers would have to benefit from, uh, uh, from the system. Uh, then uh, number two is about uh, what is the level of preparedness, especially by the ministry in terms of uh, the destination of goods, the prices which are now really uh, skyrocketing, and also provision for alternative markets. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick and Evans. As the PS answers these questions, let's think about the commitments we would like to make um, so that we can give the, C the PS something that he can go away with from this conversation. The e voucher we're about to conclude, it was delayed because of uh, bureaucracy. It had to go all the way to cabinet. But now we have all the necessary approvals. The only bit that is remaining was the onboarding of, uh, of uh, the agrovets, which will take part in this. I think this week I'll, I'll look to see whether we are ready to launch it and uh, to support smallholder farmer with access to, to inputs. We have moved away from uh, procuring and dishing out fertilizer because of the obvious uh, reasons. We are monitoring the prices, but the power uh, to manage prices is with the competition authority. And so once we have monitored and gathered information, we will guide the competition authority on what would be reasonable so that they can take uh, the necessary action. Market is a devolved function. We are working with the, with the, especially local markets. We are working with the Council of Governors so that they are able to, to find alternative spaces so that uh, trading can go on. But at the same time, we are also working to facilitate exporters you had Kenya Airways, the Dreamline has being used now to ship goods into Europe because the global, the, the food demand is global. We are not the only ones who are looking for food. 
everybody is looking for food. And we had a meeting the other day of FAO and AU, and it was quite obvious that the global supply chain must also remain open for, because not all countries are self-sufficient in food, especially African countries. So there are also high level conversation around that same issue to make sure that uh, the food trade is uh, sustained. Thank you very much, Bona Pierce. I have one question from Juni. What is the government doing to proactively promote local production of food instead of allowing imports, especially from China, in the case of fish, when we have suppliers from Western Kenya and others, as well as local manufacture of fertilizer, especially organic fertilizer that can be made locally? Um, just to note, this will be the last question so that we, we can wrap up. We are about um, 20 minutes out from the timeline we had anticipated to stop. Yeah, we, I, I invite the questioner to visit our website. Uh, we have a, a strategy called the Agriculture Sector Transformation and Growth Strategy, which uh, has nine areas which we have been working on. Area number one is support to the smallholder farmers. And uh, here we, we, we are looking at working with accelerators to support the smallholder farmer and create an ecosystem that makes the smallholder farmer produce. Our biggest problem is that the smallholder farmer is very inefficient. So for example, in Transzoia, where you expect a bag of, uh, an acre of maize to produce 40, 50 bags, they're still producing 17. And so that is a problem. So we have to work with the tools and accelerators to get them to reach to 40. And if they're able to double their production uh, alone, then the issue of importing maize would not even arise. In terms of, um, of uh, fishing, capture fisheries will not give us more fish. It will just... Uh, uh, lead to overfishing and fishing of young fish, so removing even future stocks. Aquaculture is where the opportunity is, and aquaculture can happen anywhere. It doesn't have to happen in Lake Victoria, but there is a model of cage farming in Lake Victoria, which is new, introduced by a young American there, but he was struggling to, to socialize it because people are used to the capture fisheries, which is uh, depleting stocks. So the trend is that in future, most of the fish will come from aquaculture and mariculture. And um, there's a whole effort program in the ministry towards developing again our mariculture. Under the uh, economic stimulus program, there were a lot of fish ponds, but after some time, we could not sustain them. So we need to introduce the culture of Aquaculture. Most of the fish that is coming from China is from aquaculture because those are tilapia. They are not from the marine environment. They are not from lakes. They are from aquaculture. And part of the solution is the, the issue of animal feed and making it cheaper. And that is why we have allowed the importation of the 2 million bags of yellow maize. And uh, we are working with Akefema to see that the animal feed prices come down because it applies to fish, it applies to chicken, and it applies to, to milk and, uh, cat and, and beef. Our animal products are a bit expensive. So that's why it's easier to import, it's cheaper to import and they will still be competitive. So we are working with the producer organizations to make it cheaper. But we are also promoting large scale farming. So we are working with the IFC, International Finance Corporation of World Bank to create some large-scale farms on public land that is owned by public institutions like the prisons, ADC, because we are not going to feed this country with smallholder. Maize is not a smallholder crop, actually. It's a large-scale crop. You make profit from volumes. And so we uh, even sorghum, all these cereals. So we are working with them. IFC, National Land Commission, the Ministry of Lands, to shift so that at least we can have like 30% large-scale farms and 70% smallholder farms, mostly growing horticultural crops. Right now we have 60% uh, of the smallholder growing maize 
on one to five acres, it's a, it's poverty guaranteed because you can't make much money from five acres of maize. You can feed yourself and the neighbors, but you can't create wealth. So we have a comprehensive plan and we will be rolling it out. We wanted to roll it out, but COVID sort of derailed us, but we'll keep it on track as part of the recovery plans. Nemaisa, may I just uh, ask one last question on the fish? Yes. Yes. Uh, great. Thank you very much, Bona PS. My question is around uh, the fish. If you allow me just to take you back there briefly, because um, right now, as you right, rightfully said, uh, the future of fish is in agri uh, aquaculture. Now, um, Kenya has been in importing fish from China. Uh, we know very well that uh, we have we have uh, more than 200, about 260 to 270 uh, um, uh, cage fish farmers in on, on Lake Victoria. We know that uh, Uganda has got a very robust uh, 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 aquaculture on the lake, and we know that right now Uganda is producing um, a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of uh, tilapia. Um, my comment is that uh, we think, or I think, that um, the the lake, the the aquaculture on the lake, uh, needs to be uh, supported in a robust uh, fashion. Uh, recently, when we were at the uh, at the summit, the agriculture summit at the uh, safari safari park, uh, some of the partners were are, are very eager to support and help grow the agri the, the aquaculture value chain on Lake Victoria. The big challenge I know that there is there is right now um, uh, there, there, there are private sector players who produce fish and who have been for the longest while uh, trying to actually register uh, fish cage fish farmers association. And for one reason or other, they're not able to get this done. So my request is uh, we would be glad if um, through you and working closely with your, your, your colleague uh, 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 PS and Tiba, if we can have this registration done, because it's very sad to hear that there's no data on uh, on, on on fish when we know very well that fish is literally, if you like, a staple protein food for close to three to four million uh, Kenyans. So my my submission, Bana PS, is if if we can have this uh, Cage Fish Farmers Association registered, so then when we find ourselves in a situation like this. We are not grappling with what do we do with the with the, with, with the availability of fish. And lastly, we know very well that that the key food um, value chains, dairy, maize, and, and quite the other few, have had robust support with regard to assisting the, those value chains. And we know, and it could be historical, the fish sector has not been supported. And um, uh, that's why it is my humble appeal, Bana PS, that we have the fish farmers, the cage fish farmers association registered. Uh, so then when we're in a situation like, like this, we are not grappling the data, we're not grappling supply. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pass on the message and uh, the State Department of Fisheries has a whole budget for fish every year, five billion. And uh, there are a lot of investments uh, coming that way from if Fat and uh, from World Bank, but I'll pass on the message. I think it's important. We in the ministry we want to register all farmers, and we want to support the formation of farmer organization. We are calling them producer organizations because it makes our work easier and uh, it makes uh, marketing of produce easier. When the farmer organizations collapse, then the it becomes very difficult to coordinate anything working with the individual farmers. So I'm sure it's a policy of the ministry and in the strategy that we put farmers into producer organizations, either as cooperative or as associations, so that we can work with them as a stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bona PS. Um, and now I would like to open up for anyone who's got any commitments they would like to make. Um, following the conversations we've had. Uh, let me just begin as Ken CCI. I think for us here in the situation room, you have a focus to ensure availability, accessibility, and 
quantity of food and water. As can see, this is something that we've already been working on um, here in Nairobi and across the country through our chamber offices, and we commit that we shall continue to do this. Uh, uh, we are doing the, uh, the data collection in Nairobi County and we will be in other interventions that you have. Uh, Evans, over to you. Thank you so much, Namaisa. I think there's a need for us to really make some urgent steps on our end because time has not allowed us to really have part of the conversation we were to have in terms of uh, the commitments. But I think there's more engagement that we'll have to activate on our end in terms of ensuring that there's availability of data and uh, ensuring that the updates from the PS and the ministry are well uh, uh, convinced to the necessary actors. And this will align to the unified communication that we've been exploring uh, with the partners from um, NC, uh, the, the partners from NBCC, and even yourselves. Besides that, as soon as the nutrition information is available, uh, I think we should be able to share it with the public through our robust platforms, because uh, we need to also follow up on this and uh, ensure that uh, that information is available. Uh, when appears, we want to give our commitment in terms of um, assisting the government in ensuring compliance of the directives uh, to secure the numbers going beyond the 5.8 million already identified as the needy population. In terms of the two issues that you addressed, that was in uh, uh, the number of the vulnerable Kenyans and the markets, uh, uh, we will explore this deeply within the membership of EAPN, specifically the Kenya Philanthropy Forum, and work closely with KNCCI to see how best we can plug into those gaps that you identified and uh, and um, uh, we push to the level best that the level best that we can. For now, I think um, I'm okay from my end, Maisa. We have a huge responsibility ahead of us, and uh, we will do our best to ensure that we support the government interventions as they change day by day and as this, the situation uh, uh, unfolds day by day. Thank you, and uh, Maisa, you can uh, bring us to an end. Thank you, everyone. I would just like to say thank you very much for everybody who attended. It has been a very beneficial uh, session for all of us. Um, a number of questions have been answered. And we now have access to information that will help our members, both uh, EAPN and KNCCI, and all the other institutions that joined. Uh, Bona PS, we are committed to ensuring that COVID does not change our way of life so dramatically that we cannot pick up. We are here to support and we commit our time, our efforts, and our energy. We focus a lot on the vulnerable as KNCCI, the small traders, uh, the border border, those in the markets, hawkers, they are all part of our network. And so in, your, in the two points that you raised, we are already working towards ensuring they have water sanitation, they have masks in various markets across the country. And um, besides um, that, all we can say is thank you very much for the time you have given us. I know you had a meeting at 11 and we are grateful that you actually spent more time with us. Uh, we do apologize for the little hitch that we had at the beginning. Um, and from ourselves, it's just to say Asante. Uh, this now closes the meeting. Um, all the questions that were asked, if there are any others, will be a channel in which you can um, pass messages back to the ministry on the things that you would like addressed by the ministry. And for, bon for you, Bonapiers, we are here to also give um, to, to create the bridge for communication to pass through to both our networks in philanthropy and in business. So this is uh, now the close of the meeting. Thank you very much all for attending. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, team. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.